of all the great world teachers, I suppose Gautama Buddha came the nearest to be a, being a psychologist in the modern sense of the term. He was deeply involved in the entire phenomenon of mentality, and to him the mind was often the slayer of the real. And today we have lost much of our natural interest in the functions of our own minds. We take mentality for granted. We are assuming that we have certain mental allotments of abilities or debilities and we must live with them. It is not, however, always possible for the individual to chart his own mental course of thought and action. And this morning it seems that it might be interesting to consider how the individual could be his own psychologist, how he could do for himself certain services which he now pays rather handsomely to have someone else perform for him. We have long taken the attitude that we must never do things that we can pay someone else to do. But now, with the present high cost of living and the cost of high living, we are reviving in some of our natural individuality. The mind, according to Buddhism, is a machine very much like a native natural computer. The mind computerizes not as the result of a mechanical structure, but as the result of a living, vital integration of values and processes and resources. The mind is a living instrument. It is not something that you turn on and off. It's not something you buy spare parts for. It is, however, a constantly functioning, ordering mechanism. It has the power of recording and perpetuating records. It can bring out things that are long forgotten. It can accomplish the most interested, uh, most involved uh, processes in memory, thought, things of this nature. So it really is a tremendous instrument in its own right. To use this instrument, perhaps it is best, again, to see how Buddha summed the matter up. He points out that the mind itself has six essential functions. It is a machine. It is not the soul. It is not the spirit. It is part of the structure that has been created to protect the human being in his mortal existence in the kind of world we live in now. It is therefore a defensive organism to protect the body, the emotions, and all of the processes of daily living. It is a defense against fear, against worry, against grief. It helps us to achieve judgments and honesties that would not otherwise be possible. Therefore, the mind is a very happy and healthy part of our economy. Now, Buddha tells us that the five sensory perceptions that we all know, sight, hearing, taste, a feeling, and uh, the general structure of the body itself, hearing, all these faculties are parts of a machine. And as parts of a machine, each has an independent existence. Sight has its own world, a world of processes, a world of intricate interrelationships. The faculty of sight is one of the most extraordinary faculties in the worlds of creation. Things seen, therefore, become very important, and a great many human beings live almost totally dependent upon this one faculty. Everything that they see, they believe, and without some outside and additional help, 
seeing can be a treacherous and dangerous thing because seeing is only one part of an instrument for accumulating knowledge. And if this part is developed beyond all others, it can result in an individual living almost completely on the surface of the phenomenal universe. In addition to this, the second probably most important of our faculties is hearing. Hearing and seeing together are used probably for 90% of our judgments. Uh, hearing enables us to learn. It enables us to communicate with each other. It, it enables us to develop a variety of arts. It has given us music and it has given us poetry. Hearing is a very important phase of knowledge. Hearing is also the source of a great deal of unfortunate pressure. Hearing, for instance, as enveloped in modern rock music, can be a very deadly thing and has been held responsible for a great deal of sickness among small children. Uh, the uh, problem of noise means a process of sound which does not contribute to progress but ends in confusion and very largely the degeneration of a faculty. Therefore, it is up to the individual who learns to see thoughtfully to also hear thoughtfully and to combine these two faculties for the advancement of his general insights. In addition to this, of course, we have specialized faculties such as taste. The power to taste various flavors can be defensive. It can prevent us from taking a great many poisons into the system. But taste is also a tyrant in its own right when separated from all other sensory perceptions. Taste can be give us the epicure. It can give us the individual to whom food and drink are the most important things in the world. Uh, taste also is a first line of resistance to nutritional balance. It helps us to keep on eating things that are not good for us. And if taste is allowed to run its own course without discipline by any other faculty, it can lead us into all kinds of physical dilemmas. So we have to uh, give it only proper consideration. The sense of smell is also a very useful aid to things and it is particularly strong in the development of the animal world. The animal depends upon scent for a great deal more than we do. But even with the human being, pleasant odors, perfumes, incense and things of this nature are a pleasure to the individual and sense of smell also warns of decay, deterioration and various unhygienic circumstances which can cause trouble. Therefore, it also is one of the guardians of the body, the mind, and the emotions. The sense of feeling is uh, also rather generally considered. Today, we are not as acute in feeling as we used to be. But even now, very few people will buy an expensive article without touching it. They want the communication of the feel of fabrics. Gradually this can become so skillful that the quality of all kinds of wools, silks, and synthetic materials can be instantly estimated. The sense of feeling also gives us the study of surfaces and many different uh, things that can be obstructions or dangerous to us. Feeling can tell us when we have something in our hands that is sharp or could injure us. So all of these faculties have their own particular power to help us in living. Now Buddha points this out without question and he says these things are all true. But what happens? What happens when these five senses all go their own ways? each one doing exactly according to its own most natural or abnormal instinct. 
supposing the individual tries to cater to all five of them. This could be a rather complicated situation. So nature has also given us what Buddha calls the most important of all the sensory perceptions, a sixth sense, which is called the mental coordinator. Now a, co co a coordinator in any field of activity is usually a person who must try to keep the peace, must try to make things work together, must learn to harmonize dissonances, and must finally become the director of this symphonic pattern of sensory perceptions. So the mental coordinator is the sensor. It is that which demands the right to bring faculties into proper order and relationships. The mental coordinator must therefore, first of all, be accepted as a leader and must then be catered to, in a sense, or kept in a state of constant information concerning the functions of the five sensory perceptions. The coordinator must know what they are doing and make sure that they are not doing that which will injure themselves or break up the unity and pattern of the mental integration. Now nearly all mental difficulties in this world are due uh, to misunderstandings or misinterpretings of sensory reflexes or sensory observances. The individual is constantly struggling with one sensory faculty against another. Now one of the Greeks, of course, pointed out that the deadly enemy of any sensory perception is what might be termed some type of opinionism. It is something by means of which a single faculty is catered to, is given precedence over all the others, and the other faculties are used not to make a contribution, but to support the attitude which is already held in the mind. Therefore, most people in their thinking are more concerned in trying to prove that they are right than to find out what right is. Also, nearly all of the mental and emotional functions defend attitudes, defend opinions, defend prejudices, and contribute to the continuation of destructive memory patterns. The memory is not skilled, is not trained. But now we look around to see what it all adds up to. We see this thing we call the human brain. We see it connected to the outside world by certain sensory bands. We see it sitting enthroned among the testimonies of the parts of itself. The five senses are all parts of the brain-mind. They are more than simply physical factors. They are psychological, chemical processes going on in the mind. So the mind looking out through the eyes sees all kinds of things, some of which interest him and others disturb him. Looking out today through the eyes, he has the privilege of enjoying the television, radio, and news media. After listening to it for a while, he is so sick he is practically ready to go to bed. <laughs> but the eyes bring him all of this material through a secondary series of eyes, such as motion pictures and television. The mind, therefore, is constantly bombarded, and the fact of sight is continually reporting conditions that gradually come into prominence through visualization. The eyes result in the visualization of virtue and of vice. There is visualization of violence, crime, there is all kinds of negative testimony, and there are also what we all hope for and look for, benevolent testimonies. But the eyes in this case create by themselves a way of life or a series of convictions which are at the moment afflicting a large part of the human race. These are the uses of visual imagery to perpetuate 
attitudes that are essentially wrong. Now, the person, if he uses his mental coordinator, must naturally censor what he sees. Without censorship, the faculty of sight can lead to terrible disasters. So he must learn to censor his own seeing. And in order to censor his own seeing, he has to go back again to the mental coordinator. For this gives him a series of cooperative internal functions, such as experience, memory, tradition, religion, philosophy, and common sense. Now, common sense in Buddhism would be the common testimony of the five senses. It means that they are all having their say. They are all proving what they can prove about themselves and each other. Also, the common sense carries within it the superstructure of the sixth sensory perception power, the coordinator. So when you see something on television, on the street corner, or wherever you see it, memory begins to associate with this. Where have you seen something similar before? Where have you read about it? Where have you studied the meaning of it? What do you, you know or believe concerning the merit or demerit of the process that you are considering? If the uh, coordinator is functioning and the mind is normal and proper, it will censor itself. The mind can prove, for example, that similar things have happened to you in the past, and when you treated them properly, they improved. When you mistreated them, they got worse. So wherever a new incident arises, the coordinator, like the computer, will bring into focus previous knowledge concerning these things or that particular thing. This process is almost instantaneous, and therefore it passes as a thought or a remembrance or something that we knew but had not noted lately. Actually, therefore, through the media of the sensory perceptions, we bring in all kinds of testimonies. Uh, through the eyes, we also bring in the printed page. We bring in the book that we plan to read or have read. And we are confronted instantly, more or less, with the estimation of the meaning of that book. Is it a good book? Is it a useful one? Or is it a trashy publication? And then comes the moral question of why do we like it? Do we like it because it is a superior achievement? Is it a literary masterpiece? Or do we like it because it plays to some negative attitudes in ourselves? Do we pick it because it is a sensational work? Or do we pick it because it is instructive and valuable to our lives? The whole field of fiction, therefore, comes also into focus. Fiction is more relevant than we may realize. Fiction is very often simply a verbal form of symbolism. Fiction may be an imaginary situation based upon circumstances that could be true, and the end of these circumstances is a situation that might exist. In, in Tibet, for example, there is no fictional literature. These people have never believed in fiction. They have wonderful legendary, all kinds of allegories, fables and moral, moral writings. They have wonderful fairy tales and so forth, but these things are not considered fiction. If they have a foundation in some integrities, if they picture something that is real and important, then they are worth reading. If they cater only to sensationalism in ourselves or in some way to uh, superficial instincts, they're not worth reading. So they, the Tibetans have the simple statement, if it isn't true, don't read it. This, And you might say, if it isn't true, don't look at it. Because the more you take in things that are untrue, the more you may be influenced by them. And unless the mental coordinator steps in and proves to you conclusively 
that this is imagination, this is fiction, you become over-influenced with something that is not true. The coordinator, therefore, comes in wherever a problem arises. And the problems that arise are quite similar to those that many persons take to their psychiatrist or psychologist. They take their problems to try to be guided toward a solution. Now, the only reason, probably, that they choose someone else to become their coordinator is because the mysterious mental integrator is weak in themselves. The uh, machine of the six senses is weak in the coordinator, which should bring all information into balance and integrity. Now, we are learning from computerization that there is an incredible amount of information can be stored on a small disk of paper. We are learning all kinds of things which prove to us the absolute incredibility of the recording of various types of information. And yet the computer is nothing in comparison to the human psychological organization itself. The computer has given us certain knowledge, but it is the individual's own integrations and integrities that have given us the great patterns upon which computerization is based. So here we have someone going for help. They're going for help because of one of numerous circumstances. They are going to seek help, of course, basically, because they're in trouble, or undecided, or uncertain of a course of action. They do not go if they sh uh, know exactly what they intend to do. Of course, some t often try to bluff their way even through psychological conferences to force their opinion upon the psychologist or psychiatrist. But for the most part, these people are confused, they're upset, they realize they are not using their faculties properly, and they hope that someone outside of themselves will substitute for the coordinator the power of bringing it to common sense within themselves. Now, each person has a possibility of looking over his own nature to determine very largely what his problems are and how they can be handled. There is no problem that arises in human life that cannot be handled. Some of the handling will be difficult, some of it painful, but it can be done. And for the most part, the sooner it is done, the less painful it will be. Now we have uh, several codes. Buddhism had its Ten Commandments, which are a little different in their wording, inasmuch as some of them are for the laity and some are for the clergy. The Mosaic Code of the Ten Commandments, the Sermon on the Mount, the Ethical Codes of Confucius, the ancient beliefs of most peoples, India, China, Japan, Korea, American Indians, Aztec, Maya, Taltic civilizations, all of these were built upon codes, codes that are very important, codes like the Code of Amurabi, the oldest moral code we know, the Justinian Code, all the way down to the Code Napoleon. Uh, these codes tell us certain things truths. And for the most part, people in trouble have violated a code. Very few have violated a code they never heard of. Nearly everyone who has violated a code is aware that they have departed from a pattern which has long been established as reasonable and normal. Nearly everyone who has violated a moral, ethical code must accept the inevitable consequence. He goes to a psychiatrist or psychologist to be told what was the mistake and how he must try to correct it. He knows the mistake himself, but he believes that he has not the power, the will, the courage, or the strength to correct it himself. And also he believes in a mysterious abracadabra in a science called psychology, which will work miracles that he cannot work all by himself. Most of this thinking itself is very poor, but it is quite common. 
having decided in his own mind that a person is uh, unhappy, the problem comes to find out why. And in looking into them, himself, the five sensory machine can bring him a great deal of pr present testimony and former testimony. He will learn, as Buddha points out, that the problems all began within himself. And then because they began within himself, he moved about into the environment around him, causing this environment to be deformed by the pressures from within himself. And then these inner pressures that have been brought out into the environment are returned again as problems into the individual who be began the cycle in the first place. In other words, nearly every problem we know in life is some kind of a bird that's come back to us to roost. It is our own bird. Now, uh, many people realize this, and we have all kinds of repentant people who wish they hadn't done what they did do, and repentance then goes into them, coordinated, to find what's going to come out. And in every instance in which an honest question is asked, and the individual will accept honesty, the honest answer will come from within himself. The only thing someone else can do for him is to reiterate or strengthen the realization of his own answer. We are the cause of our problems, and all the business about there being uh, curious circumstances, phenomena, uh, mysterious, unreal pressures, all this is simply evasion. The individual is in the midst of pressures which require his own solution. He must do what is necessary. In the business world, this is rather obvious today. A person who wishes a good job must study and get the necessary skills to make that job possible. If he has the proper skills, he will find the job. If the individual with problems has the proper internal integration, he will solve his own problems unless his condition has deteriorated to the degree that the mind itself is completely sickened. All the superficial decisions depend upon this division between what we want to do and what we should do. And unless these are the same thing, we're in trouble. We must want to do that which is next for us. We must want to do that which accomplishes the greatest good for all concerned. But selfishness stepping in unbalances this whole situation. And selfishness is supported by the testimony of the five senses through a series of intricate delusions. It is cr created by interpreting into everything on the outside the vices that we ourselves are nursing inside of ourselves. We will take, for example, that we are entitled to cheat others because someone else is cheating us. This philosophy of life leads to an endless cycle of crime and sorrow. The individual is only secure when he is right. He is only right when he is fulfilling the highest level of integrities of which he is capable. Now, the higher levels of integrities for many people are locked within these mysterious psychological disks which can be brought out only when need arises. Every problem that arises to some way and some degree will be answered from within the person, for things cannot happen to him that he is incapable of understanding. There are many things happening that he doesn't want to understand. There are things that he has been told by other people that he can't understand. He has been told that the only answer is to go to someone else who doesn't understand him to find out what is wrong with him. So the uh, cycle goes on indefinitely. The one benefit that comes out of this whole situation, therefore, is faith. Faith is the belief that somebody else can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Faith, in its way, is a very valuable power, but faith should always be used to prove that we have the strength to overcome weakness, whatever it may be, in our own integration. The worrier is a person who has allowed the negative mental mechanisms to take over. Everything he sees adds to his worries 
and nothing adds to solution. The next person in the same environment finds that he is aided and strengthened for all kinds of decisions. And on the same planet, with the same society, with the same world problems and conditions, all kinds of people in all degrees of development are living out constructive destinies on the one hand or destructive ones on the other. And they're all in the same environment. We are all part of a pattern. Now, it may well be that coming into this pattern, we intuitively and instinctively realize there's something wrong with it. This is probably one of the most fundamental lessons that we learn from the machine of the sensory perceptions. It shows us crime. It shows us dishonesty. It reveals to us lack of integrity. It tells us beyond all doubt about the intolerances and cupidities of human nature. So we see the situation and we also realize that we make, must make some adjustment to it. Now the adjustment that most likely suggests itself arises from the mental faculty that observes the, the problem. If it's something we have seen, the uh, faculty is very apt to say, do what you see others do. They are doing it, therefore, under existing conditions, you must do it too. Now this produces nothing. It only means that twice as many people are in trouble. No one gains anything by making mistakes on the grounds that other people make them. Now there comes a question. How are we going to avoid these mistakes? Well, in the old system of Buddhism, back in the uh, what is called the Hinayana, our small vehicle, uh, the only way to get away from these mysterious mistakes was to simply walk out of them. The uh, monk renounced the world, left family and kin, went out into the wilderness or the desert somewhere, and lived by himself on a hut, in a hut. In the early Christian, that Christian mysticism, the same situation prevailed. Those who wanted to escape the sins of the world simply moved out. They went to some deserted place or joined the monastic order and spent the rest of their lives transcribing manuscripts or painting icons. They left the world behind and refused to be part of it. Now this uh, was all right to those who had been trained in Indian, East Indian asceticism. It was a different kind of world then. Nobody can really say that these people who walked out on everything really grew very much, they sort of protected their virtues by never testing them. But the, as time went on, about the 100 B.C. approximately, in Buddhism there was a new movement called the Mahayana, or the Great Vehicle. And this was represented by a new attitude toward life, in which those who sought to develop a virtuous career did not depart from society, but began the quiet process of gaining the internal strength to dedicate thought, emotion, and effort to constructive purposes. The uh, Hinayana sought salvation for itself. The Mahayana sought the salvation of all that lives. Therefore, Mahayana became the great heart doctrine of Asia. It was a doctrine of compassion of forgiveness, of living quietly in the midst of problems, and dedicating every available resource to the service of human need. This did not mean that the individual departed from his daily pursuits. It did not mean that the householder left his family. It did not mean that he thought no longer wanted to find reasonable employment because it was part of a sinful world. To the Mahayanist, his doctrine was one of inward dedications manifesting themselves through actual services to human need. The main point in Buddhism, both schools, that we have uh, to bear in mind is the egocentricity of the attitude that the individual is trying desperately to be perfect that everything must be sacrificed to the spiritual growth of the individual himself. This is contrary to Buddhism. 
because they believed that this type of attitude was a superior kind of selfishness in which the person was perfectly willing to neglect the world to save himself or perfectly willing to go out and attain illumination and let the rest of the world suffer. To meet this particular uh, mystery of action, the Mahayana school developed what was called the doctrine of the bodhisattvas. The bodhisattvas were persons who gradually, over a number of lives, through service to others, through dedications to truth, to absolute self-forgetfulness, came to the highest possible relationship with the mortal world. The only step beyond the Bodhisattva was going to go back into the great causal universe from which we all came. So the Bodhisattva always stood at the gate of the eternal. He had no further to go. There was nothing that he had not conquered within his own nature. There was no selfishness, self-interest, or egotism, no spiritual ambition, nothing of this kind. There was only complete acceptance of the world, of the truth, and infinite compassion for all that lives. So in this moment, the Bodhisattva has to make the great decision, whether to go on to eternal rest, or to go back and labor in the world for the common good. Those who did this in the Buddhist Mahayana system were considered the greatest of all. They came back to the world, took back or took on the illusion of life, but lived to serve only the great causes that were worthy of their support and insight. The Bodhisattva doctrine, therefore, was an obligation that no individual would seek ultimate liberation from the world until he could take the whole world with him. This is the idea that caused northern Buddhism to become probably the greatest moral force in Asia, a force that was warm and kind, no tyranny, no intolerance. Buddhism never condemned another faith. It only condemns the individual who does not live a faith that he claims. And even this condemnation is very light in passing. There is no time to worry about all these mistakes. The time has come to leave them behind and do that which is next. Now, most people live in a comparatively small world. They live in family, among friends, in a locality. They have a job. They have a certain recreations. They have married children and grandchildren, all this type of thing. They live in small worlds. And these small worlds are symbols of a greater world. The family is the symbol of creation itself. It is the symbol of the universe. Friends are almost like other cosmic systems that are close to us in one respect or another. But it is in this comparatively quiet environment that each individual, according to Buddhism, must work out his own salvation with diligence. Those were the last words of Gautama Buddha before he entered the Nirvana. We must all work out our own salvation with diligence. This salvation does not have to be glamorous. It does not have to be enormous. It does not have to be something that changes the course of universal destiny. It is the individual proving that in the place where he finds himself, he can achieve victory over his own fears, his animosities, his antagonisms, his false ambitions, and the various failings of jealousy and greed. It is actually the test the Greeks and, and the Egyptians considered the family an initiation so did Confucius the family was the great symbol of human growth and if the family is secure as uh, Confucius pointed out in his Analects if the family is secure it supports the state if the support state is pure and true it supports the nation if the nation is right it supports the universe. All of these attainments arise from the simple fulfillment of the proper destiny for the individual. We therefore have at our disposal, in our own family lives, in the daily associations, five valuable sensory perceptions that can point out to us what we need to know immediately here and now. These uh, faculties may not be sufficiently strong to support us into the unknown future. 
But to the Buddhist, there is no unknown future. That is a point that is very important. There is no unknown future because every individual knows his future, whether he realizes it or not, the moment he commits action. The future must, must necessarily be the fulfillment of the causes which he himself has set into motion. The future, therefore, is as good as he is now and as difficult as he is now. Having a, come to some such a thought as this, the problem of how to work it out more constructively is to make better use of all of these faculties with which we are endowed. We must learn to see that which it is best for us to see. This does not mean that we do not observe things that are not best, but because of inner integration, we cling to those things which are best. We see things that we wish were not that way. If it is within our power to change them, we do so. But as Francis de Assis pointed out, what we cannot change, we must endure with spiritual insight. So the individual, in his home life and so forth, and it is in this area, usually, that he goes to the psychologist. He goes to the psychiatrist not because he is worrying over the fate of the Afghanistans. He is going because he's having trouble right now in his own life. His job is threatened. His family is breaking up. His home is weak. He doesn't sleep well. He isn't eating well. The body is beginning to show the wear and tear of intemperance. He has tried to escape through alcohol, narcotics, or tobacco, and he's still sick. All these things are immediate personal things. Now, no individual is born into this world who does not possess the power to correct himself or govern himself if he so desires. This is clearly pointed out uh, by Thomas Aquinas, that all of these things are within the control of the individual. But to control himself, the individual has to go against a certain kind of pleasure that arises from breaking rules. The person likes to do what he likes to do. And as a result of that, he later has to live with that which he does not like to live with, the consequences of his own conduct. Actually, we are all tempted continuously and will be as long as we live. There will never be a moment when the opportunity to be angry, disappointed, or disillusioned will not arise in our environment. If, however, we build upon this, we will gradually settle down to an acidity which we can no longer endure. So off we go to get clinical help. But actually, the problem can be solved right inside of ourselves. So the next time the problem arises, to commit any action that requires censorship, put the censorship of the coordinator over it. Control it. The next time you have the opportunity to disparage someone, put the coordinator over it. And remember the words of Jesus and the dead dog, when the apostles wanted to know why the master looked so sadly at the dog body, the carcass that was rotting with the roadside. Jesus answered, pearls are not whiter than its teeth. This is not in the Bible for probably a good reason. It does not support exactly what theology wants or would like to support. But it points out one thing, that if we have the sufficient depth of insight within ourselves, we can find something good to think about, something good to talk about something's good to share with almost anything and anyone that lives. The problem then is to pick up this point quickly. And when you're just about ready to make a destructive or negative remark, let the coordinator step in. Now how do we strengthen the coordinator? That's a pretty good question. We all have it, just as surely as we have hands and feet. We have the coordinator as surely as we have eyes and fingers to touch and handle things. It's there. But it has been allowed to languish. It has been allowed to fail to become dominant because it requires a kind of strength. Weakness will never win. There's a great difference between weakness and meekness. 
Meekness is very healthy. Weakness is very unhealthy. So weakness is that which causes us to keep on doing the things we want to do, regardless of their effect upon ourselves or other people. These kind of weaknesses break homes every day. These kind of weaknesses turn orphans and the parentless children out onto society. These weaknesses all arise from to the impulse to do exactly as we please, regardless of consequences. And we assume that when we do this, we are happy, for happiness is born upon freedom. Now, freedom is a nice word, but it is used badly. Freedom is not license. Freedom is not the right to do as you please. Freedom is the privilege we all have, the tremendous privilege of free will. Each of us can please to do that which is right. This is the supreme example of freedom. We are not slaves who have to make the mistakes of others. We are free to make our own mistakes, and have made a great deal of this particular point of view. We have taken it and tried to live by it. Now, what can we use to strengthen the coordinator? Obviously, if we were thinking right, and if we were seeing correctly, and the senses were all functioning normally, we would be right and do right. Therefore, there are mistakes in our own attitudes which constantly prevent us uh, from achieving control over our own lives. Well, one of the things we have to do is to find out where strength does lie. In most cases, the average person has never had an ex a sincere experience of moral strength. Some have, and it has made them the heroes of the world. But to the most people, there is a sense of weakness. Instead of saying, I can do what I should, the voice seems to say, I can't do what I should. We cannot rise above weaknesses in ourselves. Now, where are we going to find strength larger and greater than weakness? Mankind has been working on this problem since the beginning of time. And the only answer that apparently has been satisfactory up to now has been religion. Religion is something that has become the ever-present help in time of trouble when we wanted to do right. Religion has been a belief in the supremacy of right, in the absolute power of good. And religion takes the attitude, in particularly Oriental religions, that the whole universal plan is created and maintained to bring to each individual the realization of faith. The person must have a source of strength greater than himself. In antiquity, the child turned to the parent as a source of strength. The average person turned to the temple as a source of strength. But everywhere always there had to be some power strong enough and great enough to lead the individual into the fulfillment of his own life. This being true, we have it now today as part of our philosophy of existence, that the great truth is that God and one is a majority, that in some way God now doesn't represent a person. God represents a principle of integrity. God manifests as the moral power within the individual to do what is right. It is that which is forever sustaining the best. But in our daily living, we have given it very little opportunity to express itself in that way. We have thought of deity, for the most part, as a kind of sovereign over us, and like physical sovereigns, primarily concerned with the divine work itself, or the establishment of its own empires. Actually, however, uh, nearly every great mystic, nearly everyone who has risen above the level of the commonplace and the fields of service, integration, self-sacrifice, and forgiveness has been to some degree a mystic, has been to some degree under the influence of a powerful benign faith. Uh, these things all point out the fact that today perhaps most people could handle their own affairs better 
if they did have faith in a supreme power. For instance, if they looked for authority, not in terms of wealth or political power, but in terms of integrity or universal power, they would be able to make many decisions that are now beyond them. We are likely to assume today that the great uh, monopoly, uh, the great industrial complex, the wealth of great fortunes, great industrial enterprises, that these are the big things, that these are the things upon which our opinions must be built. This is completely false. We should this, but know this by now, when half the great corporations of the world are in debt over their heads and will never pay off. Actually, we have put our faith upon physical wealth, power, authority, station, as being able to protect us. And yet, not all the wealth in the whole world will not protect us from one living, vital bacteria. We are in a universe in which what we have trusted is not trustworthy. So we have to find that out, and we do it by using the faculties of sight and hearing, particularly, to know what is happening. But if we see these things and still remain the same, then the coordinator is not developed to the degree that is necessary to lead us into a better way of life. So we must use the faculties that we have to censor our own conduct, to recognize what is necessary and what is next, and continue to live according to the best that we know. We also realize that the moment we begin to strengthen these inner resources of character, we find that they grow rather rapidly, and that the first step is always the most difficult and that after that we'll discover that each improvement in ourselves is reflected by a betterment of our social relationships and helps us to live in a better world. Now we won't all gain this at once, but we will all gain something if we begin to use the faculties that we possess. The great inspiration is there. We are all inspired by a common misery. We are all looking for the answer to things that hurt. We are looking for cures to physical ailments. We are looking for cures to moral and emotional stress and vice. We know definitely from the sciences around us, even in the material world, uh, that many cases of sorrow, misery, and pain are simply due to wrong living. We know that uh, the hospitals are filled with people who really did not need to be there, uh, but through intemperances and so forth, they gradually destroyed their physical resources. These could have been saved if they had thought and allowed character and strength to lead them away from their bad habits. But if they use strength to support the bad habit, then the trouble is complete. So we say if a person really wants to uh, be a personal psychiatrist or psychologist over their own conduct, that they can start with little problems that come along. Uh, we sometimes uh, don't realize a mistake until a little while after we make it. But we can, of course, keep a sort of psychological diary over this. Now, uh, the psychologist that we pay $50 an hour to or something is scrib scribbling a few notes as he goes along to see what he can do to put together some kind of a pattern for us. We can scribble our own notes. We can have a notepad in there handy or in the purse or pocket in which we can say at 2 o'clock I was rather nasty to someone. Now, I was mad at the time. I was very much uh, put out. I felt that I'd been very, very badly treated. So I just kind of nursed this grievance. Four o'clock the next day, I found out that I'd been mistaken in my point of view, that I shouldn't have taken that attitude, that the other person believed he was right and was do trying to be helpful. So then we sit down and we consult these things. Here's an example of something. This friend of ours happened to catch us one afternoon when we were driving a car with about three or four too many drinks. He said, look, don't do this. Stop it. You should not carry, drive a car when you're under alcohol. 
And of course, the alcoholic was duly indignant. He wasn't under alcohol. He was as sober as a judge, only he didn't know where he was. <laughs> the answer to that was he hated the man who said it to him. Well, after he had paid the fine for driving under influence of alcohol and had his license suspended, this man who turned he turned away from as a gabby old gentleman was really his friend, was trying to help him. And we never know how the Lord is going to speak. He sometimes talks to us to people we don't even know. But always, if there's a message, take it. If there's no message, forget it. Now, on another occasion, we'll say the situation is different. In another occasion, uh, we are actually uh, damaged by another person. We have uh, betrayed them, or we have done something that was very bad for them. And uh, the sufferer has a feeling of great indignation. I know a case in which indignation like this lasted for 60 years. The person never spoke again to the individual who had injured them. Now, the truth of the matter was the individual had injured them. But well, that injury took about 50 minutes 60 years ago. And the rest of the 60 years was spent remembering it. And the more their memory strengthened, the more the trouble grew. And this memory de de determined and distorted the life of that remembering person for years. The whole of life was made less desirable by a nasty memory. Now that memory uh, was probably true. But we are warned in the sacred writings to do good to those who most certainly do evil to us. And we must definitely forgive our enemies. Now, forgiving our enemies is quite a trick for some people. They just can't make it. They feel that their grievance is something that they did not deserve. Therefore, they have a right to resent and continue to resent the person who thus offended them. This is be all true, but every major faith of the world and most of the better philosophies all agree that the only answer is to forget and forgive. Now, we must get some kind of a moral integrity into ourselves and realize that the first thing that happened, the other person hurt us, and for the rest of, the li of our lives, we hurt ourselves. Therefore, transmute and try to understand the situation. Look back very carefully, and you may find considerable foundation for forgiveness. In the big excitement of feeling mad and bad about the whole thing, very often we forget what we contributed to our own misfortune, that we did things that helped to make that injury likely, probable, and inevitable, that we were not guiltless in it. The guilt consisted in the fact that maybe somebody injured us before we got the chance to injure them, which was also part of the plan. There are all kinds of factors but they all add up to one thing, that a person who wants to stay away from the psychiatrist must learn to get over all forms of grudges, must get out of the system those things which have a tendency to be unpleasant. Now, this does not mean that we must actually go back and live with people who have hurt us. The main problem is they don't probably want to live with us either. But the point is, we must stop living with the ghosts of these persons inside ourselves. We must forgive them if we feel uh, that they have injured us. We must try to understand the lesson to ourselves. How do we become richer and more complete as persons as a result of solving a grievance? Why is solving a, grievance, a grievance the basis of personal growth and strength? We grow by what we forgive, and we get weaker by what we hold on to, if it's negative and destructive. So we take all the different things that happen to us in life, and we try to make them fit into a pattern, to find out, if we can, why we are frustrated. One of the major problems of today, of course, lies in the field of matrimony. There are a great many unhappy homes, there are a great many uh, miseries in these fields. 
or where a condition arises in which some form of decision is obviously necessary, we must try to make such decisions as will gradually strengthen our own inner insight. We are not expected to endure the impossible, but we are also expected to learn something even from that which we cannot endure. Everywhere there is something to be learned by every instance in life. There is something to be learned uh, when we are in a car wreck. There is something to be learned uh, when we lose a job. In everything there is something that must help us to rise above the commonplace reactions of individuals who simply pout and gloom their way through the years. We can't afford this type of thing. So if you are thinking a little bit of going to psychologists to find out how your stations are at the moment, first ask yourself, what do you really love in this world that is more important than yourself? What is it that you would like to be which would be of greater benefit to other people? Why do you want to advance in your estate? Do you want more money? Then that is a very weak payment. The great payment for experience is not to accumulate wealth, but to accumulate insight, understanding, tolerance, kindness, and love of humanity. Now, it may well be that in the course of your life you're never going to do anything exceedingly spectacular. Perhaps you are not going to rise and lead nations to freedom. But you are going to have the opportunity to go out of this life when the time comes in a better condition of personal growth than you brought with you when you came. We must learn something out of living. Unless we learn, there is no living. Life is not simply a, a, a veil of circumstances. It is a pattern of projects and purposes. Life is something that we have to use to grow. It is the supreme opportunity to outgrow ourselves, to build a new foundation of character. When we leave here, that's all we can take with us anyway. We cannot take with us anything except the integrities which have become real and vital in our own lives. When we understand this, we will escape a great many of the imperfections and problems that beset most people. Ambition is an interesting thing. Ambition is something that makes us want to do more, uh, to have more to ascend the Lord ladder of social preferences, to become a leader, to gain wealth, to become capable of dominating, influencing, and controlling other people. Perhaps the highest end of ambition is dictatorship, an imperial relationship with the rest of life. Now, most people consider ambition a virtue. They think that if, in, if the individual is lacking in ambition and doesn't want to be the president of the society or organization to which he belongs, who does not wish to be the richest man in his community, if he doesn't have these kind of attitudes, he is doomed to failure. He'll never succeed because he doesn't have the grit and very temperament. Against ambition, which is nearly always a heartbreaker, there are other things to consider. Let the ambitious person for a moment say to himself, I am 30 and I am ambitious. I want to be the head of the corporation. Then say to himself, use your eyes, which are among the keys of uh, wisdom, and your ears, which tell much, and look at the present head of this organization. He worked through until he was 40 or 45 or 50. And finally he got the job that you now hope to have someday. If he is fortunate beyond all normal expectancy, he may hold that job for till retirement. In other words, out of a lifetime of effort, he may be the chief executive for five or ten years. Then he is going to retire. He will be presented with a grandfather's clock with chimes <laughs> and live from there on on his pension. He will probably be welcome to drop in occasionally 
and shake hands with a man who worked for years to take his place. This is success. This is the big thing. This is what causes an individual to give up family, friends, neglect his children, neglect the improvement of his inner life, or for what? For ten years and a swimming pool. <laughs> and of course, many of the people who, know, who have swimming pools do not know how to swim. This is another unfortunate thing, so they settle for a jacuzzi. <laughs> All of this is part of something you should see in yourself and see what you're doing and see how much better you might have been had your life been centered upon something else. Ambitions are competitive, but aspirations are not. No matter how much you gain, how far you advance by aspiration, you injure no other human being. You take no job from anyone because what you are trying to do is grow and growth is the release of the best part of yourself you may never be the president of the corporation but then you will never be also the one who has to retire and sit around playing golf for the rest of his life your aspirations are those that make you want to be better to know more to serve better to be more understanding of life, to increase your knowledge and skill in those areas which endure. In other words, aspiration helps you to build up a treasure that moths cannot destroy nor time corrode. Aspiration is to leave this world a greater human being than you were when you came here. And being a greater human being, you will have discovered that this greatness as its perfect fulfillment in humility. That instead of thinking of how great you are, the greater you will become as you think how little you know and how little you can do in the presence of the infinite potential of existence. So in one way or another, you can put your life in order. You can try to understand people who disagree with you. Today we have a very serious problem in the world on religion. Religion is something very necessary. And most religion admit that religion is very necessary. And yet each religion is desperately afraid that some other faith will compete with it. That some other faith will get the some privilege. Or that that which is not true will overwhelm that which is true. And anything that believes that is untrue itself. So that instead of working together to give the humanity the example of a dedicated service of principles, these faiths become competitive. They become ambitious. They have ambition to greater number, greater and more magnificent churches and shrines, when their real purpose is to aspire to be a greater service to living things. So religion gets into trouble because it competes. The individual gets into trouble in his own opinions because they compete. There is very little difference between an individual who differs on the nature of the Holy Trinity and the individual who differs as to which team of baseball players is the best. They will fight over these things. Each one has his own opinions, and opinions are truly, as Epicurus says, a falling sickness of the reason. Everyone's opinions are unvalid unless they arise from the coordination of all available knowledge and resource. The individual, even if he is correct, should be correct modestly and with no intention to discourage, disparage, or hurt someone else. So out of all these things, we come to the needs for a sort of a kindly life. It doesn't have to be spectacular. We're not expected to give up every mistake we make. We cannot also lose every grudge we are still desperately clinging to. But we can reduce by degrees their authority over our consciousness. We can come more and more into the light of common sense which is the testimony held in common by the senses. 
bad judgment is always due to a deformity in the sensory patterns. A bad judgment is due to the acceptance of an untruth as true. And once this untruth is accepted, all superstructures of error can be built upon it. If you have a false hypothesis, all that comes from it is necessarily deformed. And most people live with a false hypothesis on some subjects. And these subjects are the errors where their unhappiness, where their conflicts, and where their bitterness can most often arise. It is just a case where the individual can, with common sense, ob obtain a level of function that is highly desirable. Most people who are very nervous today are also infirm physically. Something is wrong on the health level. Their digestion is bad, and an, an enemy can ruin your digestion. An adversary of some kind is more deadly than a bacillus. Actually, a prejudice it can actually destroy the function of your liver, and a nursed grievance can uh, open you to a great many uh, contagious or infectious diseases. The moment we break the laws of mental and emotional health, we begin to transgress physical proprieties. Today we have an opportunity to see just what all these extremes add up to. Everyone now is a health seeker. Everyone wants to be healthy. Why? Largely so that he continue to make the mistakes he's always made. <laughs> he just wants to be stronger when he does things badly. Also, in a desperate effort to uh, take care of symptoms, he uh, goes on various diets. He says, well, uh, maybe the reason I don't care for my neighbor is because I don't have enough protein. <laughs> so first thing you know, chemicals and diet uh, supplements become potential sources of happiness. They are not a source of happiness. They're a source of heavy expense. That's what they are. <laughs> and that the, the expense is getting heavier every day. It's true that we do need to watch a proper diet. But proper health depends upon the proper function of the five coordinators. The various sensory perceptions must be in harmony in order that the body can function properly. Anarchy starts in the body the moment it starts in the mind of the person who owns the body. Almost every intemperance of the body is symbolic of a psychological intemperance within the individual. If he was well adjusted, his health would improve, unless he has gone so far that he has wrecked most of his health. One of the uh, main problems of health as problems is elimination, and probably it is the most common ailment in the health pattern today. And physical elimination is something that everyone is trying desperately to regulate. But you do get a proper physical elimination. It is also very necessary to have mental and emotional elimination. We have to get out of the system the refuse of useless thinking. We have to get rid of toxins which have built up and very largely as the result of not regulating eliminations we not only allow these poisons to accumulate in the body but by not regulating our mental problems we allow psychic and psychological toxins to accumulate in the body and the lack of physical elimination is nearly always associated with holding on to mental or emotional attitudes which are unhealthy and we know that a healthy, happy, ordinated person, a person who is in a good internal balance, will have very few needs for supplementary uh, um, nutrition unless they're in a particularly unhealthy atmosphere. Always we know that the emotional factors affect the physical. There is no question in the world that the whole cycle of physical ailments as some of the uh, homeopathic physicians have realized. 
namely that these ailments arise according to the order of the twelve zodiacal signs, and that twelve basic homeopathic sal salts are created or organized to assist the balancing of these factors. That actually the individual must control the effects of the cosmos upon himself if he expects to be healthy. So every one of us is a little solar system. We have our planets, we have our elements, we have our worlds, and these are constantly forming patterns. We are having our own earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. We are having everything you can think of. But if we organize the coordinator, if we put the leader of ourselves in the position of honorable and honest leadership, we will find that largely the body will continue to improve. We will have longer life and enjoy it better. And when we do find it time to depart from here, we will leave with a much higher rating for intelligence. We will leave truly improved by the fact we were here. We will leave wiser and better prepared for the future. If life as we see it here was the end of all, there would be no reason actually for anything. If this is the end, there is no reason why we should do anything except vegetate. <laughs> but actually, man was not made to vegetate. Man was not made uh, to go through the vicissitudes of 60, 70, 80, 90 years in this world and then have nothing to show for it. And if there is nothing that survives death, there is nothing to show for it. The only answer that seems reasonable is that we are all in a business relationship with an invisible cause of ourselves. Behind the body is the true manager of our lives. And it is this internal, eternal principle behind us that we must serve, that we must please, that we must obey. And to do these things we must live up to the reason for our own existence. There's no doubt in the world that uh, we need counseling, but we need to counsel ourselves. We need to be the person who in investigates ourselves for the reason that no one else can possibly know us as well as we do. You can spend a fortune trying to share with some physician all the secrets of your life, but if you are an ordinary person, you will carefully avoid the things that you most need to discuss. <laughs> the real situation will remain encapsulated. I know one case, a very admirable worker in the field, who told me one day, he said, many of his patients, those in the deepest trouble, can come to him twice a week for a year or two years and never tell the truth. They are not going to tell the real cause, because if they tell that, they have to admit that they are wrong. They have to admit that they have been foolish, stupid, selfish, or unreasonable. They have to admit that they sacrificed integrity for some childish whim. And they won't do this. Therefore, they carefully go around the edge of it. When you get too close to the center, they change the subject. And if you get very close to the center, they may go into hysteria. But they will not tell the truth unless over a period of years, Fatigue is so great that they have no longer energy enough to lie with. Then they may tell the truth. But each person knows these problems without telling anyone. And if they correct them, there's no need to uh, really to have any people, any people know that you had them. But if you don't correct them, they're going to know whether you say anything about it or not. <laughs> so it is very important in all of these problems to really go to work on yourself and use the faculties which as Buddha pointed out you have been given in order to search out the meaning of yourself and realize that in the center of every problem that you face is yourself and that if you are able to correct this situation if you are able to find out the mistake you are making and have the courage, strength and dedication to correct it you will find life is much easier, health is much better, and you will have many more friends and many more opportunities uh, to grow and be happy.
These are the things that we are all going to have to learn one of these days. Well, thank you very much. We do things that we can pay someone else to do. But now, with the present high cost of living and the cost of high living, we are reviving in some of our natural individuality. The mind, according to Buddhism, is a machine very much like a native natural computer. The mind computerizes not as the result of a mechanical structure, but as a result of a living, vital integration of values and processes and resources. The mind is a living instrument. It is not something that you turn on and off. It's not something you buy spare parts for. It is, however, a constantly functioning, ordering mechanism. It has the power of recording and perpetuating records. It can bring out things that are long forgotten. It can accomplish the most interested in most involved uh, processes in memory, thought, things of this nature. So it really is a tremendous instrument in its own right. To use this instrument, perhaps it is best again to see how Buddha summed the matter up. He points out that the mind itself of all the great world teachers I suppose Gautama Buddha came the nearest to be a, being a psychologist in the modern sense of the term. He was deeply involved in the entire phenomenon of mentality. And to him, the mind was often the slayer of the real. And today, we have lost much of our natural interest in the functions of our own minds. We take mentality for granted. We are assuming that we have certain mental allotments of abilities or debilities and we must live with them. It is not, however, always possible for the individual to chart his own mental course of thought and action. And this morning it seems that it might be interesting to consider how the individual could be his own psychologist how he could do for himself certain services which he now pays rather handsomely to have someone else perform for him. We have long taken the attitude that we must never and has been held responsible for a great deal of sickness among small children. Uh, the um, problem of noise means a process of sound which does not contribute to progress, but ends in confusion and very largely the degeneration of a faculty. Therefore, it is up to the individual who learns to see thoughtfully to also hear thoughtfully and to combine these two faculties for the advancement of his general insights. In addition to this, of course, we have specialized faculties such as taste the power to taste various flavors can be defensive it can prevent us from taking a great many poisons into the system but taste is also a tyrant in its own right when separated from all other sensory perceptions taste can be give us the epicure it can give us the individual to whom food and drink are the most important things in the world uh, taste also is a first line of resistance to nutritional balance. It helps us to keep on eating things that are not good for us. And if taste is allowed to run its own course, 
without discipline by any other faculty, it can lead us into all kinds of physical dilemmas. Things seen, therefore, become very important, and a great many human beings live almost totally dependent upon this one faculty. Everything that they see, they believe. And without some outside and additional help, seeing can be a treacherous and dangerous thing, because seeing is only one part of an instrument for accumulating knowledge. And if this part is developed beyond all others, it can result in an individual living almost completely on the surface of the phenomenal universe. In addition to this, the second probably most important of our faculties is hearing. Hearing and seeing together are used probably for 90% of our judgments. Uh, hearing enables us to learn. It enables us to communicate with each other. It enables us to develop a variety of arts. It has given us music and it has given us poetry. Hearing is a very important phase of knowledge. Hearing is also the source of a great deal of unfortunate pressure. Hearing, for instance, as enveloped in modern rock music, can be a very deadly thing, has six essential functions. It is a machine. It is not the soul. It is not the spirit. It is part of the structure that has been created to protect the human being in his mortal existence in the kind of world we live in now. It is therefore a defensive organism to protect the body, the emotions, and all of the processes of daily living. It is a defense against fear, against worry, against grief. It helps us to achieve judgments and honesties that would not otherwise be possible. Therefore, the mind is a very happy and healthy part of our economy. Now, Buddha tells us that the five sensory perceptions that we all know, sight, hearing, taste, a feeling, and uh, the general structure of the body itself, hearing, all these faculties are parts of a machine. And as parts of a machine, each has an independent existence. Sight has its own world, a world of processes, a world of intricate interrelationships. The faculty of sight is one of the most extraordinary faculties in the worlds of creation.